This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. The following chapter is just going to go through it and touch upon earnings per share as an accounting standard. However, even though it is specifically mentioned as an examinable standard within the examinable documents list provided by the ACCA for your P2 exam, it doesn't actually appear as being mentioned specifically within the detailed syllabus. If you have a look at the detailed syllabus and look at all the accounting standards that are mentioned, earnings per share is not mentioned. The only scenario where I could see it creeping into the syllabus is looking at where it analyzes the financial position and financial performance of an entity. So building upon what you've seen previously in your analysis and interpretations that you did within F7. But from experience, there hasn't really been any analysis and interpretations questions covered within P2. It's not set up that way. Question one is groups. Question two and three begin to look at the exact uh, accounting standards, don't they? Uh, and then question four covers your current issues. Well, there's no current issues surrounding this here. Uh, I wouldn't have thought you would get examined on earnings per share in questions two or three. Uh, there, there isn't much there to discuss, is there? Uh, and, and the computations in terms of question one don't really lend itself for this essentially it's just mathematics isn't it there's no accounting for debits and credits so no accounting complexities uh, what well, all you have to do there is take one number divide it by another and adjust those numbers to make sure you're doing the correct number divided by the correct number okay uh, so all i'm just going to do is quickly quickly whiz our way through just to recap it just so you're familiar with it there are no numerical examples i don't even think there are many numerical examples in, in any of the study manuals or revision kits of your chosen tuition providers so it's up to you whether or not you just turn the video off now or carry on listening for a few minutes to make sure that you're happy with it and then walk out the exam and think well yeah eps didn't appear once again okay uh, so remember there are two types of earnings per share aren't there first one that we're going to go through and touch upon is your basic before we go through then and look at your diluted a little bit later on okay uh, basic earnings per share takes account of your current year earnings, uh, doesn't take any account of anything that's going to change into the future and looks at the number of shares that are currently in issue at the year end date. Okay. Uh, again, remember when you're looking at the, the profits uh, or your earnings, it's those that are attributable to the ordinary shareholders of the parent. So that's important if you were to work out your basic EPS in a group set of accounts. You don't take the profit for the year of the group. You take the profit for the year attributable to the ordinary shareholders of the parent. So where you split that profit for the year out into that attributable to the parent in the NCI, you take that figure attributable to the parent. Okay. Uh, likewise as well, it's the ordinary shareholders. So you may need to go through and make adjustments there for any preference share dividends, depending upon whether it is an irredeemable or a redeemable preference share dividend. Uh, in terms of the number of shares that are an issue, we don't look at the number of shares specifically just at the end of the year. Remember, those profits have accrued evenly over the year. And we need to look at when those shares during the year have been issued to try and match up a higher number of shares issued with a higher level of profits. Because as we've issued shares for cash, we, that cash will then be used to generate additional profits, won't it? So what we went through and did there is we needed to look at a weighted average number of shares that were an issue, wasn't it? Uh, again, there was three scenarios that we had. It was an issue at full price, so at your standard market value. Is it there a bonus issue? And then uh, it was a rights issue, wasn't it? Uh, full issue, nice and straightforward, dead easy. It was just a normal weighted average calculation. Remember that weighted average calculation was based upon a number of months. Uh, in terms of your bonus issue, uh, bonus issue, remember, is an issue of shares for free. So there is no cash. So what we have there is that there is no change in the level of profits. However, there will be a change in the number of shares. But if there's no change in the profits because we receive no cash, we don't really want to go through there and do a weighted average calculation, do we? So what we do is we just make a very simple assumption that regardless of when the bonus issue took place, we assume that it took place at the start of this accounting period. So assume the shares have always, always, always been in issue. The key thing to do there, however, as well, is you have already reported your basic EPS for the prior year, haven't we? 
what we would need to go through and do there is we would need to restate last year's comparatives again assuming that the bonus issue is in place for all of the preceding financial year okay uh, in terms of your rights issue that was the complex one wasn't it where you needed to work out your rights issue fraction uh, I'm not going to go into the complexities of working out your right issue fraction. I just think that is beyond the scope of what we cover within P2. The key bit there is to understand that a right issue is a mixture, isn't it, of your full price issue and your bonus issue. Because a right issue, you issue the shares at slightly below full market price. So the business does receive some cash, but also there is an element of free shares issued as well. So you need to work out what that element of free shares is. And you do that by working out that right issue fraction. Again, don't forget that we also need to go through there and restate any prior year comparatives. Again, I don't think the numbers are going to be examinable. The only thing that I would go through and mention is that small point there, because it does tie in a little bit to IS 10 events after reporting period. So it says that bonus issues or rights issues occur after the reporting date but before the date of approval of the accounts just note the eps should be calculated based on the number of shares following the issue so even though they've been issued after the reporting date the financial statements haven't been authorized so let's make the assumption that they were actually issued at the reporting date and work out the eps based upon that figure okay a very small point to consider with is 33 and is 10 it is an adjusting event okay uh, and then what you've got as well is it there your diluted earnings per share uh, your diluted earnings per share remember goes through there and takes account of future issues of shares based upon what was outstanding at the reporting date and how that future issue of shares could potentially impact your profits for the year. Okay, uh, what we had to go through and do there is we needed to look at was it your convertible and was it there for your options because your convertible instruments at some point in the future will be converted into shares. Uh, but when you convert those debentures or convertible instruments into shares, we no longer pay interest. So as well as adjusting for the additional number of shares, the maximum number to be issued in the future, you also need to account for the fact that there will then be no interest paid in the future and therefore your earnings will go up by the post-tax interest saved. With regards to your options, with your options there is no impact on your profits for the year. However, there is an issue of shares into the future, isn't there? And what we need to go through and do there is we need to look at those options and make a, a calculation as to work out how many of those shares issued under the option are in essence free because when an employee goes through and buys those shares under the option they will go through and pay a lot less than the market value so essentially what they are doing is they are paying for a certain amount of shares at full market value and getting additional shares for free so we needed to be able to calculate the number of shares that we got for free under the option and those free additional shares were incorporated into our number of shares within our weighted average number of shares calculation, wasn't it? It was added on to the weighted average number of shares. Again, remember, things are dilutive in nature, aren't they, if they reduce your basic EPS? So options were always going to be diluted because it didn't change your profit figure. It always increased your number of shares, didn't it? So that by its very nature will reduce your earnings per share so it's always dilutive whereby your convertibles the likelihood is that they will reduce your eps into the future but you do just need to check that it is dilutive in nature first before you go through and include it within your diluted eps calculations okay that's it uh, if you've hung, hung on uh, and gone through there and carried on listening excellent you never know it could crop up in some small way, shape or form, but it hasn't. It's never been seen. Uh, will it be seen into the future? I do not know. I would guess that it wouldn't, so I wouldn't spend too much time working your way through it. Focus on other areas of the syllabus that are much more relevant and much more important. Revenue, financial instruments, share-based payments, pensions. They crop up time and time again. Focus on those. Forget about your earnings per share. I wouldn't worry about it one little bit.